I can't be the only one who from time to time thinks, I wish I could start all over. That I could just wipe the slate clean, forget about what I've just done, and have a fresh start. One of the reasons I love the game golf is that you can get a mulligan. When I play with Craig, he often gives me a mulligan. It's where if you take one shot and it just flies off into the bush and doesn't go anywhere, you just forget about that, ignore it, start again. And we, I can't be the only person in life who thinks, I need a mulligan, I need a fresh start. Normally for me, it's because I've said something stupid. I've said something that has offended someone or hurt or upset somebody. And I think, oh, I, wish, I wish I could wipe that slate clean. We've got to a part of our story in the Genesis, book of Genesis, where actually I'm not alone in that feeling. Because even God wants to wipe the slate clean. Genesis 6, verse 5, says these words. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Ow! The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. But Noah. We are at that part of the story in Genesis where there is an ark and a flood and the animals come in two by two. And uh, it is an amazing, amazing story. It is a story that is so well known that is actually kind of jumped out of the Christian world and into almost child fairy tales scenarios. It's a story that we will have heard growing up. Uh, we were probably told to our kids. It is such an amazing story, but it is so much more than that child story. There is so much more to it. This is fully pun intended. But the Noah story has an arc of a narrative. Thank you, thank you, thank you. There are more to come, don't worry. <laughs> or do worry, depending on what you think. There is an arc to the narrative of the story of Noah that fits into the arc of the narrative, the story of the whole of Scripture, the story of God. And we need to understand that to understand the fullness of why this story is so amazing. And so we're going to look at those, that story today. But um, the story of Noah and the ark covers about four chapters in Genesis, and I don't want to read all of that out to you this morning. It will take us forever. Um, but what I do want to encourage you to do is to go home and read it. Um, read it. Uh, also, read it in your community groups this week if you get a chance. I'm just going to concentrate on the beginning of the story, the end of the story, and the bit that I like to call the post credit scene, like in Marvel movies. We're going to pick up on those three parts of the story today. Let's pray, and we'll jump straight in. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is living and breathing and speaks to us today. And so we ask that you will, you, it will speak into our hearts this very moment. Breathe by the power of your spirit into our hearts and minds, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, quickly, the beginning of the story, Genesis chapter 6, verses 9 to 22. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people. 
for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make for yourselves an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening of one cubit high all around. I don't know how big a cubit is. Use your imagination. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I am going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you and be, to be kept alive. You are, to take kind of, you are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. It's such a well-known story. It's such a brilliant story. But to fully understand it, we have to go back to Genesis chapter 3. Um, Adam and Eve, who decided that they weren't going to take the command of God, they were going to do their own thing, that they wanted to become like God themselves, missing out on the fact that they had already been made in the image of God, and so they ate the fruit. They rebelled against God and said, no, I want to be God of my own life. I want to do my thing. And it, it is an uh, echo that has gone throughout humanity and lives even with us today. That sense of rejecting God and going in our own way. Second pun intended. The fallout of that. I mean, Josh is even shaking his head. He doesn't even... Okay, fine. I'll move on. The fallout of Adam and Eve's decision continues with all of us. The fallout of that sense of we reject God and we do our own thing and we allow our decisions, our choices, our selfishness to move us away from God. Last week, Jeff, um, who leads our church plant down at St. Ed's, was back uh, preaching to us in his own kind of excitable way. And um, he talked about the downward spiral of sin. That it kicked off with Adam and Eve and it moved into Cain and Abel where we see hatred and jealousy and murder and lying. And it continues to spiral out of control. So much so that as we get to Genesis chapter 3, God's like, it's everywhere. The inclination of every human heart is evil all the time. Because as Jeff told us last week, the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. Our world will tell you that the problems that we face as a society can, that the answers to those problems are to educate and to legislate. That's what our politicians will tell you. More education, more legislation. That will control people's behavior, will move forward, there'll be progress. Now, those things are good in and of themselves. I've spent too much time in education myself. I believe in it. But it is not the answer to the human problem. If it was, our world would not be in a mess today because surely we must be the most educated generation of all time. And yet there's wars and famine and brokenness everywhere you look. The problem at the root of humanity is our heart. It is our desire to do our own thing. The evil in our hearts. And God looked at that, looked at that, and he said, let's wipe it out. Let's wipe the slate clean. Let's start again. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. One man who God looked at and went, he's blameless. He's not, his inclinations of all his heart aren't evil. He 
he doesn't do all those things of hatred and murder and idolatry and lying because he walks with his God. The word blameless here is the Hebrew word for tamim, and it's linked also to Genesis chapter 17, uh, where we hear this uh, being said about Abram, who says in chapter 17, Ab- when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty, walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Walk before God and be blameless. Sometimes we think to ourselves that Christianity is just about a ticket into heaven when we die. But actually, it is about us being invited into a relationship to walk with God. This is the arc of the narrative of Scripture. It starts in Genesis 3, because Adam and Eve heard God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and then they hid. They hid because they were naked and afraid. Their sin had separated them from that intimacy of walking with God, and so they ran away. God was then looking for people to walk with him, and he found Noah. He found Abraham. He invited him. And this is the arc of the whole story, that God is continually inviting you and me, not into some kind of ticket of heaven later, but to walk with him in the here and the now, to maintain a proper relationship with God. Because when we walk with someone, there's intimacy, there's trust, there's a sense of being involved in their everyday, there's a sense of relationship, of telling people how you feel and walk alongside. When, in particular, when men walk alongside each other, I don't know if you've noticed this, um, men, when they sit and talk and face-to-face, conversation dries up quickly and reverts to sport. But when they walk alongside each other, shoulder by shoulder, suddenly conversation flows. We walk, we are invited to walk with God. And our arc continues. Revelation chapter 21. The whole story of this is God has said, okay, that relationship has been knocked out. Our our sin has hidden us from it. But in Revelation 21, we read this, that God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. God is inviting us to walk, to dwell, to be alongside him. That is the eternal life that he is offering to all of us. And he found one man, Noah, who was able to walk with him. Last night, um, I went round to a friend's house to watch the rugby. Hello, all my Welsh rugby fans. Um, uh, Watched the rugby, and then I walked home. And uh, walked home on my own. It was only like 7, 7.30, something like that. It was dark. And there were parts of the journey as I walked home that were pitch black and slightly scary, although I'm big enough and ugly enough to look after myself. Um, And it was fine. And so I get home, and it was all good. It was dull. It was lonely. It was a little bit weird. But I got home. Later on that evening, I had to walk down to meet my daughter, who was finishing working in the fish and chip shop. Great job, by the way. Free fish and chips most nights. It's brilliant. Um, But I went down to walk her home, so she didn't have to walk on her own. And we walked back, and the conversation just flowed. She wanted to tell me about her day. She wanted to tell me about her, the people who had annoyed her. She wanted to tell me about the things that had brought her joy. She wanted to tell me about how tired she was. And it just happened, and then conversation flowed. We even laughed as we walked home. The time flew by. When you walk with someone, you're known. There is intimacy, there is a relationship There's safety. God wants to walk with you. He is calling you into a relationship with him that means we walk with him constantly. Noah walked with God. He trusted God and he did exactly as God called him to do. He built an ark. And so there begins the story of 
Noah. He goes and builds this ark. And I'm actually not going to concentrate too much on the animals walking in two by two bit. Um, there's a whole lot in that story that you can read for yourself. Some questions that you might pop up in your head. For me, I still don't understand why the lions don't eat all the other animals. But I'll let you to have a look at that passage. We're going to jump to the end of the story, Genesis chapter 9. And we're going to continue reading from verse 7. God speaking after the flood has gone away and they've landed back on dry land. As for you, God says, be fruitful and increase in number. Multiply on the earth and increase upon it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. And with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, all the wild animals, and all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth, I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I'm making between me and you and every living creature with you. A covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again. Will the waters become a flood to destroy all life? Whenever, I see, whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I've established between me and all life on earth. The end of the story starts with, with God speaking to Noah and the same command he gave to Adam and Eve. Be fruitful and multiply. Get on, repopulate, get on with the world. And then he makes this covenant. God realizes that this flood that has destroyed life has not actually solved the problem of the human heart. He's found one man and he's going to rebuild, but he's never going to bring that level of pain again. And the promise for you and for me, the promise for all generation, is the sign of the rainbow. That when we see the sign of the rainbow, when God sees the rainbow above us, he will remember his covenant, his promise with you and with me, that he will never do that again. I know at times it feels like when the rains are coming, and they come in Derby, that the floods are coming back. But God's promise is that he will not destroy all life again. There is a Hebrew understanding. One, um, one theme of um, Hebrew uh, understanding of this is that, um, that the rainbow is, uh, is another word for a warrior's bow. It's this understanding that, that when the rainbow appears, it's almost like God has put down his, his warrior's bow and has gone, I am now at peace with all humanity. There's all sorts of flaws in that idea, but I do quite like the picture of it, this sense of, ah, oh, okay, no more. We'll continue. When you see a rainbow, when God sees a rainbow, he remembers the promise. We get to remember his promise to us in those moments. That he is calling us to walk with us. That is the beginning. That is the end. And then there's this weird post-credit scene. Like you, if, if you've watched any Marvel movies, you've seen the whole movie. There's been the beginning, the middle, and the end. You've got to the end of the story. The credits roll, and then you get this kind of tag-on little part of the story. You're like, what is that about? What, what's all going on now? Genesis 9, verse 20. Noah... A man of the soil proceeded to plant a vineyard. When he drank some of its wine, he became drunk and lay uncovered inside his tent. You picturing the scene? Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked and told his two brothers outside, but Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it across their shoulders. 
Then they walked in backwards to cover their father's naked body, so their faces were turned the other way, so that they would not see their father naked. Whoever, nobody wants to see their father naked, and so they took measures about that. When Noah awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves, will he be to his brothers. He also said, Praise to the Lord, God, the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God extend Japheth's territory. May Japheth live in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be the slave of Japheth. What? <laughs> Seriously. What? It's weird. And it sets it up. It's like that little bit at the end of a Marvel movie where you go, that makes no sense to the rest of the story. But it's, does this mean that there's a Noah number two coming? Is there a sequel that we're about to read into? What is this all telling us? So I also thought, by the way, that, that Noah was the one righteous, blameless man who walked with God. And now you're telling me he's naked and drunk, and ashamed. How does this, how does this work? The problem is that the flood didn't cure the problem of the human heart. Noah was still Noah. And even though he had seen God do amazing things, and he had trusted God to build the ark, and he'd been on the ark, and he'd taken all the animals in, and the flood had come, and they'd been released, and they were told to be fruitful and multiply. We still have the propensity to turn in on ourselves. And he repeats the same mistake that Adam did. Adam hid from God walking with him because he was naked and ashamed. And here is Noah, naked and ashamed. Some theologians would go on to say it is because Noah is the second Adam. He's kind of repeating the same patterns that Adam had done before, and he's doing it again. And so we're left scratching our heads going, where's the good news in the midst of this? Well, the good news comes in what St. Paul writes in Romans 5, when he says this. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin was not charged against anyone's account where there was no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespasses of one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The answer to the problem of our hearts, the problem of our human heart that is turned in on itself, the answer is Jesus the one person whose heart was not turned in on himself, the one person who had the ability to go, I'm God, my heart's okay, I can do what I like, served, humbled himself, came to be obedient to God. And his obedience reverses the curse of Adam's disobedience. And so our hearts are transformed because of Jesus. We are saved by grace because of what Jesus has done for us. So if you want 
your slate wiped clean. If you're looking for a mulligan to remove the things that you said or you did to the friend or the colleague or the neighbor or your family member, if you're wanting that moment to redo and start again, it's not found in a flood. There is a promise of a rainbow that says God will always be with us and will always remember us. But it's found in Jesus. It's found in Jesus' obedience to, G- to God all the way so that we can be forgiven through his death on the cross and his resurrection to eternal life so that we can have eternal life now and walk with God Day in, day out. We can trust him with the everyday. He wants involvement with us all the way. He wants to walk with us and hear about our day. Know about what's wound us up. Know about the stuff that's brought us joy. Laugh with us. Because he wants to walk in intimacy of relationship with us. That comes from Jesus. The true Adam. Reversing the repeating nature of Adam and Noah. We're going to pray together. Can I, if, if you're willing and able, can I invite you to stand? I want to pray for two things in particular this morning. Um, The first one is for those who feel like they need a fresh start. I, I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what's on your heart. But I, I think there may be some people here who wish they could just have a mulligan and a do-over. And if that's you this morning, we're amongst friends. Let's just start having that conversation with God. Loving Father, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your love and for your forgiveness, for your grace and for your mercy. Lord, we thank you for the truth that there is nothing we can do that makes you love us any more or makes you less, love us any less. And so we're asking now, Lord, that you will wipe the slate clean. You will pour out your forgiveness upon us because of Jesus. And that we may receive that afresh this morning. That new start. That new life. May we know that we're forgiven and may we live as forgiven people, transformed because of you. Jesus, we thank you for your obedience, your willingness to humble yourself and to die our death. We receive that again. Thank you, Lord. The second group of people who I'd love to pray for this morning are for those who want to grow and understand what it means to walk with God in the everyday. Maybe you feel as though you've... um, You've been on this relationship with Jesus for a period of time, whether it's a couple of months or whether it's 20, 30 years. But actually that idea of walking with God in the everyday moments, the mundane, the normal, the moments, the meetings at work, the feeding the kids, whatever it might be. That you want to say, okay, Lord, I walk with you today.
So come, Holy Spirit, and help us to walk with you. every moment of every day. Lord, we thank you that you invite us into that intimacy of relationship. May we know what it means to trust you, to be obedient to you, to find safety in you, to uh, share our hearts with you as we walk and we talk and we dwell with you. Holy Spirit, we need your help in doing that. Stop us from just thinking we can do this on our own, but to trust you every step of the way. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.